team. Uh, we are here uh, today with Dr. Umar again. Alhamdulillah. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, our conversations slash interview um, so far. Alhamdulillah. Um, so let's continuing on marriage because the issue of marriage and uh, because especially our viewers, a lot of them are married and a lot of them are very interested in the topic of the end times and, and this whole, whole social disorder that we're in. And and they find themselves in these marriages, in these situations where things are not in order and they don't know what to do. Mm. And, and, you know, we, we find cases one by one, but it's like, uh, I, I guess, uh, Dr. Omer, if you want to, as we're talking about marriage, I want to mention this point and then maybe get elaborate and then we can talk about marriage. It's like a machine that has many parts, right? And, mm. and marriage is, let's say, one of those parts. But if we're living in a society where everyone does whatever they want, it's like the machine's not going to work because every little part wants to do <laughs> whatever it wants and the machine's not going to work and bring that order. And so... <clears throat> The reason I mention that is is that a lot of those dimensions of disorder come into marriage itself. Mm. So the the marriage becomes dysfunctional for many reasons, and uh, and I think that's uh, a lot of people are struggling. Uh, like uh, I have a lot of friends who say, you know, I used to like I know this sister that said I want to leave my husband because I don't love him anymore. That's the reason, right? Mm -hmm. And. I don't know how valid that is, how invalid that is. Mm. Uh, uh, a lot of husbands are like, uh, I think I want a second wife because I don't really love my wife anymore. Or a lot of brothers feel like if I get a second wife, it'll actually fix my first uh, <laughs> marriage because I'll be able to ignore or tune out uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the wife with the second wife. The, I'll be able to tune out or balance the first wife. With the second wife, under the assumption, of course, that the second marriage would be perfect. Uh, uh, yes. So, uh, so let's start <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> you know, this uh, not being in love and, 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 and stuck in marriage. And a lot of times I've also noticed is that, uh, and, and this is touching upon what you touched upon yesterday, but there's a lot of arguments, even in good marriages. I'm talking about good marriages. I'm talking about like my marriage. OK, mm -hmm. so in good marriages, we're still arguing about who's right and who's wrong. And so what's your advice on uh, in terms of, well, let's start with um, I don't love my wife anymore. Oh, or, or yeah. I don't love my husband anymore, either way. Well, uh, gosh, that's a whole big plate you just loaded up here. That's a that's a great buffet. Uh, let me begin by saying that everyone has trouble with marriage. Okay, marriage is not easy, but it is necessary. Mm. Uh, it is uh, you know, you know the, the the entire history of humankind began with marriage, okay? Now, I'm not talking about prehistory. Prehistory we know ex existed, but we don't know that much about it. What we know about history begins with revelation knowledge. It doesn't begin with archaeology. It begins oh, with revelation point. knowledge. Interesting point, yeah. Yes, archaeology just confirms what revelation okay. so we know from revelation knowledge and no other source just the scripture that the history that is his story we get in the over my nine story uh, using the male image there sorry ladies it begins with begins with marriage. So there's no other begin history, just a single individual. 
everything begins with marriage, everything. Okay, so the first thing a person wants to know when they meet you is, well, there's a couple of things, you know, the British, how do you do? This, uh, this has a lot of implications, this, this uh, question, when they, they greet you politely. It means, who are you? <laughs> who are you with? And what and uh, what good are you to me? Okay, <laughs> all of that is is in there. How do you do? It's not a selfless statement. Mm -hmm. It's a query. I want to know who you are, why you are here, and who you are with. Mm -hmm. Now, the who you are with first of all begins with who is your mate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because we judge each other, first of all, by what we wear. Mm -hmm. And the predominant clothing that we have is our spouse. The Quran makes this very clear. Oh, mashallah. Yes, yes. Okay. So you judge somebody where... So if you have a uh, an individual who is um, dressed like a backstreet bum then that's how you judge him because mm. that's how he presents himself mm. and so the the term that refers to chivalry begins with marriage you see because we want to present ourselves with a noble character mm. this is the ideal in islam uh, i'm just trying to repaint the archetype here because right. uh, no, what I you say what you put on my plate is a big shambles. It's chaos. There's no archetype there, you see. So we need to make a, a steak here, something big and juicy that the people can get their teeth into. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to do. Um, not that I'm an expert, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about these things because I made all the mistakes that you are discussing. I've been there. I've done that. And I'm older than most of your audience. So I have some years of experience and I've had some years of reflection, thought, you see. And this reflection and this thought is what is in obedience to what Jibril uh, said to uh, the, the prophet, the very first word, read. Well, you read everything. Thing. You don't just read. You see, when a when a uh, a jungle dweller goes into the forest, he reads the forest. Right. Okay. He studies it. Okay. So I have done some of that, and from that reflection and that thought, I have gained some. By the way, in the sense that you just used the word. So I want reading. to. Uh, in the sense you read, you use the word reading, and uh, it's actually mentioned in Quran where it says, Ikra bismi rabbika read in the name of your Lord who created. Meaning, reading yes. creation is the word of Allah, too, right? Yes. And and so, yes. so you're either reading but, but, a book or you're reading his creation. Yes. And we're recreating it, you see. Uh, for example, when we write, which I do a lot of, we are recreating our thought, okay? And the reason we do that is to remind ourselves what it is that we're thinking and to share those thoughts so that we get some reflection. And this is what uh, Al-Arabi uh, spoke about when he talked about the, the being the reflection of the divine, you mm -hmm. see. We reflect God, but we want that godness, that godliness to re reflect, to come back to us as well in our relationship. And there's no more significantly important relationship other than that with your spouse. Your mm -hmm. spouse is your closest neighbor as before. So chivalry begins where? At home. Right. It begins at home. This, this uh, recreation, this redemption of the noble character, this uh, uh, transformation of the shadow has to begin in marriage. You can't uh, 
pretend that it occurs outside of marriage. It begins in marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay. How, how should I say this? I, I'd like to use the the analogy of the left and right brain, you see. But let's just say, let's just use an analogy for want of a better one of a soccer ball. Okay. Now, can you play soccer with half a ball? No. No, you cannot. You cannot play the dean with half the dean marriage mm. is half the dean okay mm. so please listeners get this correct because i missed it <laughs> I, I missed it several times i've been married six times okay that's how much experience i have <laughs> now fortunately my present marriage has been wonderful it's not been without its rough parts but it's been a good run uh, for the last 12 years or so and, and uh, of course we're getting older and it's not as easy to fight as it used to be when you're younger mm -hmm. but you can still duke it out okay you can we still do from time to time not as often but it happens okay so I have learned this from experience. You can't play the game of life with half a ball. Hmm. You can't do it with chivalry. You can't do it nobly. You can't do it righteously when you don't have the other half. And the other half is marriage. It is the sunnah. So Islam begins there. It does. Okay. This is why you have this problem, which is something you brought up yesterday, and I want to revisit that. It comes to mind now, because it, they have, we have this wonderful hadith that says uh, Islam or heaven lies at the feet of the mother. Right. Uh, right. Is that correct? Well, mm -hmm. she's supposed to be lying at the feet of her husband. Mm. Get it right, ladies. All right, mm. get it right. There is no heaven at your feet if you're not at the feet of your husband. Mm. Okay. Now, I'll tell you a story from Al Torah to illustrate this because uh, this is what happened to one of the prophets. Um, I believe it was Jacob, but they, it may be a later one. I've forgotten their names now. Uh, because I, I don't visit those books anymore. It's been years. I'm, I'm into something else now. And I'm into, I'm into writing about marriage now. So anyway, um, what happened was that uh, the prophet had been working in the, the field for uh, uh, harvesting. And he lay down at night in the local barn. And the lady whom he was interested in who wanted to be, he, he was interested in marrying her, but he hadn't said anything yet. She came to him that evening and did what was uh, tradition. Mm. When, uh, without words, you see, uh, the women in those days would go visit the man that they wanted to express themselves, they're, they're interested, and they would take, they would lie down at his feet, you see, and and they would take his feet and press them against their bosom. Hmm. Okay. This is not naked. This is with, with clothes on. They would just lie down, put the feet against the bosom as an act of submission. Okay. Hmm. To his authority. Hmm. This has everything to do with what the prophet had to say that in the present time, in our generation, 50 women would ask a man for his name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this name has to do with protection. It has to do with reputation. It has to do with honor. Mm. Everything to do with that. So all of that is in this gesture. She was asking this man, uh, a prophet, to give her his protection, his name, his husbandry. Mm. Okay. No, I'm saying this because... But women today that are working and they have a salary and they're like, what protection? I got my, eight, you know, I got yeah, my they, security they, system they, house. They, they, I think they don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. This is, a, this is an illusion. 
this is an illusion. But you, you're correct. They think they don't lo- they don't need it, but they're they falling into the trap of the monetized mindset. Okay, you have to understand that this whole banking corporate enterprise is new. Mm. It it did not exist in the history of the world before. This is a new Jewified entre- enterprise, and the entire modern and postmodern mindset is taken up with money, mm. and people are substituting money for respect and for honor. It doesn't work that way. It's a false tr- construct. Mm. What our uh, what works for us and what is valuable for everyone is relationship and honor and respectability in the relationship, not in the bank account. You see, the the bank account in days gone by was how many children do you have, how uh, how how is your farm doing, how many sheep. You know, you you look at Abraham. You know, he had servants. He was a Bedouin. Okay, he had his own tribe. This mm-hmm. man, and he had I don't know how many camels, how many sheep, but you know all this. That was his money. This was real goods. Money is not real. It's an abstract idea. It's an abstract contract. It's an abstract concept. It's supposed to represent reality, but when you throw riba into it, reality is gone. Mm. Everything. Dis- disappears because what is real is being taken away from you. When you submit yourself to this mindset, everything that you have disappears. It disappears. And I do want to. And you may think that. Yes. In the, in the so U.S., you know, talking about this being an illusion, uh, I don't think, you know, a lot of times we think that there's no crimes around us because we live in these <laughs> areas that look safe. But when you look yeah. at the statistics and you look at the programs, like the, uh, the, the, the programs that they've made over by, on the issue of violence, like documentaries, mm-hmm. TV series about mm-hmm. people murdered in their houses, people, you know, theft in the houses, murder in the houses, um, yes. uh, you know, uh, it happens by the thousands every year. And so yes. no one's really safe. It's just that we have the illusion of being safe. It's an illusion. It's it's an illusion and it's a delusion. All right. So the the modern feminist who is living this delusion uh, is doing so uh, out of mm, I have to say necessity. Now I want to get back to the feet of the man. Okay. See, because the woman is doing this because there's no feet. The feet of the righteous men are not there. Hmm. You see, you have a you have the feet of a lot of men who think they're righteous, but they're not. Hmm. They're not. You have a lot of men who who are uh, pursuing a religious knowledge, but they have no practical knowledge, so hmm. they cannot provide stability. They cannot provide even spiritual direction because you can't provide spiritual direction unless you're also a material leader. Mm. See, Abraham was a businessman. Okay, Mm. he exchanged goods. He traded. He had his flocks, his sheep, his camels, maybe even horses. God knows what else. Plus his slaves. All right, because in those days that was common. Mm hmm. And slaves were also a part of property. So all of these things were under his feet, under his thumb. But Mm. you go to many men today, they have nothing. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, they used this verse from the uh, Hadith. It says, uh, okay, the Prophet said, well, he he knows Al-Fatiha, so that's worthy of marriage. Well, I suppose that's a good beginning. It, it might be a good beginning, but it is a good not good beginning like, when you're already with the prophet in Medina, with the Muslims, <laughs> with yes. people to look up to, you know, very yes. different. 
Wish. It's conditional. It's conditional, you see. Oh, I know Al Fatia, you can marry me. And the woman goes and looks at him and says, oh, Yeah, well, he looks kind of cute, but uh, what's in it for me? Mm. You see, it's a business deal. Marriage is a business deal. Okay. Mm. Now, the woman who lay at the feet of the prophet here was uh, a, a, a lady who was um, a, an orphan. Okay, her mother was a widow, so she was in dire straits. So she wasn't doing this just out of the goodness of her heart. She was doing it out of necessity. If I give myself to this good man, I am guaranteed a safe, stable life. And this is absolutely necessary for a woman. Why? Because she's going to be for God's sake, you can't rear children in an unstable, unsafe environment with mm. no provision. Mm. So if the man, all he has to offer is al-Fatiha, that's yeah. not enough. Right. Okay? It's not enough. Get it through your head, oh, you religious fool. Yeah, I mean, the Quran okay. uh, stresses on the mahar, the, the dowry that uh, he yes. has. And... and the dowry is something that may or may not be important. I mean, the prophet said, look, the best marriage is the one that costs the least. But you see, this, this coming together is still, whether it is of high social standing or low social standing, you still need some place to live. You need something to eat. You need shelter. All of these things are necessary. Mm -hmm. And if the wife cannot receive these from the husband, at the foot of the husband, she has to do it herself. Mm -hmm. And that removes her from divine order. Mm -hmm. Okay? It removes the entire social realm from divine order because the men are not keeping their responsibility. Mm -hmm. So because if, the man you know, is not in uh, doing what he's supposed to do, that automatically forces the females to be outside, yes. you know, the the divine realm too. Uh, that's right. We, so if that's, there's disharmony correct. with the men, there will automatically be disharmony with the women. That's right. And if she's not at the foot of a godly man, heaven is not at her foot. Hmm. Okay. And even if she's at the foot of a man who can provide all of the outward guidance, all of the outward necessities, if this man is not truly spiritual, if he's not truly righteous, heaven cannot be at her feet either, for the most part, because she's going to be living in strife. Heaven is not a, in a state of strife. Mm -hmm. The divine order... The kingdom of Allah, the kingdom of God that Isa spoke about, that the the apostle that that uh, 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 Prophet Muhammad was bringing to establish on earth, it cannot be there if the man is not righteous. Mm. So you have a lot of these mother-in-laws living with unrighteous men, trying to rule over their daughter-in-laws or their son-in-laws. And saying, heaven is at my feet. Heaven is at my feet. Heaven is at my feet. No, it's not, you fool. You fool. Heaven is not that kind of a tyrant. Mm. Of okay. <coughs> Excuse me. It makes me upset when I see, I see this. <clears throat> and I'm sure you see it, and, I, and I've seen it all too often. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and told me they have trouble with their in-laws, especially oh, yeah. mother-in-law. Okay. Yes. Yep. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a, an interesting tradition from the Sioux Indian. Okay. They're monotheists, by the way. They had their own prophets and they're recorded. They have a long oral history of this. Mm. Now, what they do is when a man... Uh, marries, uh, and uh, he goes to visit his uh, mother's wife, uh, they're not allowed to speak to each other. 
<laughs> so if, um, if the, if his mother wife want, wants to talk to him, she has to ask her daughter, mm. ask so-and-so if he would do such and such for me. Mm. Let's see. Uh, are you with me? I'm with you, yes, yes. I can't I'm, hear you now. Something I'm with you. I'm with this transmission. Uh, no, it's going good on my side. Oh, I can I cannot hear you. Anyway, if you can hear me, I'll just continue until I get you back, or we can try to reconnect. It should be Hello? It's fine on my side, alhamdulillah. I can hear you just fine. Uh, okay. So the the purpose of this is to maintain shiv is to maintain chivalry. Mm -hmm. Okay, because often you see whether it's a son-in-law or the mother-in-law. The mother of one of the spouses always thinks the other one is never quite good enough for their child, you see. Right. right. And they're always intervening. They're always interfering. So to avoid this, Sue made it a tradition that the mother-in-law does not speak with the daughter-in-law or the son-in-law. They have to go through their child. Mm -hmm. They do not speak directly in order to make them, to force them to think about what is going to come out of their mouth, you yeah. see. So there's wisdom in this. Um, I, I'm, I'm not against mother-in-laws, but I am against their speaking. <laughs> in, in, <laughs> if in they're the going to be... Marriage. Yeah. They're going to interfere. I've seen them break marriages. I've seen it happen. I'm sure you have as well. Yeah. And then they say, oh, it's not my fault. You know, they're, they're you know, sure it is, sure it is. Yeah, but I, again, let's just, let, I don't want to just blame it on the mother-in-law. Let's go back to, for example, the son. Okay, I brought this up the other day. The it all boils down to manliness and manly authority. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about the bully. I'm talking about the noble man. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're, good way to put like, it. Uh, you're not talking about the bully. You're talking about the nobleman. The bully, I have, I have no time for them. I won't even talk with them. Okay. If you give me a chauvinist, I just set him aside. There's not, oh. uh, there's no, there's no talking yeah. to him. Okay. Because they know everything, <laughs> and they're always right. They're worse than a woman who thinks they're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, these kinds of men. And I saw one of the comments said, oh, well, we should just beat our wife into submission. <laughs> oh, my God. This is what's destroying the, the, the Ummah. Anyway, the man needs to intervene. If his mother, okay, is destroying their marriage uh, because she cannot leave his wife alone, well, he's not providing his wife with one of her basic needs. He's not providing her with a safe, stable environment because mm. he's allowing the witch of a mother <laughs> to harass her. This right. is worse very than a gin. Very good point. And a lot of women feel that way and they don't know what it, to do. Because you know, it, if they complain to their husbands, the husbands yeah. are like, why are you complaining about my mom? There's nothing wrong with my mom. You know, it must be you that's the bad one. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's going to destroy the love, you see. The, 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 the woman, the wife in that circumstances, will, will, will lose respect for her husband. Mm. She'll lose respect for him. And as I told you yesterday, this is the most important aspect of marriage. Mm. Without this respect, without honor, without nobility, without chivalry, you cannot maintain the other two aspects of marriage. Mm. They will fall away. So when somebody says, well, I don't love my wife anymore, <laughs> I'm not sexually attracted to her, I don't love her, or I'm not affectionate with her anymore, you see, it's because respect and honor have been lost. So mm. for some reason, that person, one or the other, have disqualified themselves from the most important element of marriage. Mm. Okay, I hope that's clear. There, there's a lot of that going around. There's a lot of that going around, and nobody wants to talk about it. You see, mm -hmm. they say, oh, or they want to talk about it in terms of what you said, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not important. Everyone's right at some time, and everyone is wrong at some time. 
what is more correct, okay, and more Islamic is how you approach each other right. in this rightness Honorable. and in this wrongness. Very well put. Okay. Yeah, very well put. So this is where akhlaq comes in, okay? I, I'm, I'm not saying that right, but you understand what I mean. This is the Islamic realm of morals and ethics, okay? That is where it enters. I want to interject with uh, one uh, observation I was making as I'm listening to you is that the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mm. when his daughter got married, he didn't keep her at his house. Meaning, if there was anyone that had the right to say, look, you're my daughter, Ali wasn't very rich at all. Mm -hmm. And they could have probably used the support of the house of the Prophet, but the Prophet kept his daughter and Ali, meaning Fatima and Ali, separate from himself. Mm. And he, you know, he he allowed them to have their space, I guess is mm. the word. Yes. And he didn't, uh, he wasn't like, okay, well, you know, live with me. Um, mm. He allowed them to have their space. And yes. I think a lot of problems come about a lot of times when, uh, because of external factors like family members in a marriage. Mm. It, it mm. happens a lot. Because yes. then. The wife, especially, is stuck between the husband, the mother-in-law, sometimes the sister, you know, and 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 complaining to the husband is very difficult about the mother of the husband or the sister of the husband. It's a it's a difficult thing for uh, a lot of, and and then when they do uh, react, usually I've seen that it's not a very nice, you know, when it explodes, <laughs> and it's, it explodes back. Yes, yes. Yes, the um, the element here is that of privacy, okay, and this privacy is sacred, okay. Yes, sacred. It, it is sacred. So the intimacy, not only the sexual intimacy, but the whole realm of domesticity, is a private matter, mm. okay, and we are not to spy on each other. Mm. And even if we do, we're, we're even if we do by accident, we're to pretend that we haven't. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's not our business. Okay. And if you see something that's not your business, you don't talk about it. Right. Okay. So this uh, this gossip business is another thing that goes around and destroys people, destroys their marriages. And I understand that the traditions. Uh, in many societies are such that the son brings home the new wife to his father's house. And this is, this is okay. There's nothing wrong with this. It's not the Western fashion, okay? But it is a global tradition. It happens almost in all societies. Mm -hmm. And even if you uh, bring this person, this new spouse, into your father's house, it's only because your father has or you have provided a separate dwelling place under the same roof. Okay. Now, look at the prophet and his wives. They all lived at the masjid, and they were all his wives had a little room lined up one next to the other. So when they all woke up in this morning, in the morning, to kindle their fires after or before prayer, they all had to greet each other. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and the greet the greeting was not only bismillah, but it was okay, how can we help our husband today? Mm. That should be the correct attitude mm. when you have a multi wife family and the correct attitude in in the man's house who has children who bring their spouses home, they should wake up in the morning and say, How should we uh, how can we help grandfather today? How can we help each other today? Mm. Okay. And you you ha you can only do this with a noble posture of mm. a clock. You can't mm. do this otherwise. Otherwise, you're just going to be fighting like cats and dogs. And humans are not cats and dogs, but we can become worse than animals. Mm. And that is what's happening. Uh, can I ask you a question? Um, sure. A lot of times, um, what happens is, um, hold on. Oh, sorry. So a lot of times what happens is that uh, people are living in multi, you know, extended families. They're living yes. with mosques. Do you recommend 
uh, that each couple have their own kitchen, their own privacy room. Um, like one sister was complaining that, you know, if we even have intimacy, the parents know because yes. they take our showers and everything. And then they're sharing the kitchen and uh, yes. a lot of times yes. that causes issues. Do you recommend in the modern times that, let's say, if they um, do uh, live with extended families, that they, they, that what can be done, I guess, or, or should something be done for the, the wife to feel this is my territory or I'm the queen mm. of space? No, she, she has to have her own space. There's no doubt about that. But if she has to have her own space within the space of another queen, then she has to submit okay, to that circumstance. And she has to make the best of it. Okay? Now, let me expand this a little bit because uh, the reactionary response is, oh, I'm just going to go get my own place. Well, that's a bit silly when you uh, think about it, because if you're going to have children and raise them, mm -hmm. you need that person's help. You need the help of the extended family. Okay. And this was the advantage of, of living. So you don't have to put in them the in daycare. Yes, <laughs> this is the advantage of living in a uh, expanded domestic situation where the house is it may be larger or smaller. The problem here is that you have uh, too many people trying to crowd in on each other like rats. Okay, mm -hmm. so if the if the crowded situation is is if it's overcrowded and you're living like rats, that's no good then it's better to move out, but don't move too far. Move right. across the street or a block away keep or something together. like that. Okay, yes. You have to keep the family together because when those little babies come along, you're going to need auntie, you're going to need your sister, you're going to need your, your, your husband's mother, okay, to, to help raise that child because a child is a big responsibility and not only that they will drive you crazy mm. okay so you need to hand them from one to another now i see that in the tribal society in which i am living in thailand okay mm. Interesting. they live in large households and all of the families live close enough together so they can walk across the street, hand off the baby when they're tired of the baby or they feel like they want to strangle the baby. Yeah, I, they I, hand I, it I over. That. Yeah. Say again? Yes, I remember. Like my, my dad came from a village in Pakistan, right? And I remember when I was really young. I mean, I'm talking about I was really young, maybe, I don't know, less than 12 years old. And I remember uh, the little kids, the, the, one of the wives would give it to like my grandma. Right. And then she would play yes. with him a little while yeah. and she'd hang it, hand, it uh, hand the baby to my dad's sister, like, for example. And and or yes. it, and, and that's, that's how it was. That's natural. That is divine order, because then the child gets input and imprinting from several different adults mm. and they become socialized quicker. They learn quicker. They learn how to relate to different personalities. That child becomes very smart, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, far more intelligent than someone who's brought up in a little box all by themselves mm -hmm. without access to extended family. So there's a trade-off, and bargaining has to occur all the time. Mm -hmm. The problem is that people get stuck in this, I'm right and she's wrong. Mm. I'm right and he's wrong. Uh, modality. As I said, we're all going to be right. We're all going to be right at different times. And there's no point in arguing or fighting over a matter unless it's a matter of life and death. That's a different thing. But over which pot to use, look, <laughs> if it's your mother-in-law's kitchen, shut up. If she says this pot, it's that pot. Mm. And when, when she's not in the kitchen and you want to use another pot, then you use it. Mm. Get over it, girl. Mm. <laughs> okay, grow up. Okay, grow up.
Don't fight over these things that do not matter, you see. And, but when you do have an overbearing personality, an, a mother-in-law who's too intrusive, this has to be confronted by the son or her or, or the son's father, you mm. see. The son, if, if, it's my, if it's my wife, my mother, I would first go to my father and say, Dad, look, we have a problem here. You go mano on mano. You see, you talk man <laughs> to man. And you say, look, Dad, we got to do something with these women of ours, okay, before they take each other's eyes out and yeah. mine along with them, okay? So, look, can you please get Mom to calm down here a little bit? And if it doesn't work, if his father's too much of a wimp, okay, sometimes that happens uh, because, well, you know, you know the story, then the son has to do it because his responsibility is towards his wife. Mm -hmm. And she needs a safe environment. If she doesn't feel safe and secure and able to live at peace, then whatever children she brings into the situation, they're going to be damaged by it. Mm. See, this goes back to the dynamic organs, organisms that we are, okay? Mm. We are dynamic spiritual beings in, invested in the material flesh. Mm. And the worlds are constantly pulsating, just like the Sufis say they are, okay? Mm. They're going back and forth and back and forth so fast that you can't discern the immaterial, but it's there. Mm. So... When these immaterial things get in between the uh, give and take between the two worlds, they will damage the material world, and this will affect the incarnation process of the ensouled child, you mm -hmm. see, and it will damage them. It will also damage the wife. It makes everybody sick. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, you get this idea that you, that often comes up in the argument. Uh, sometimes a person will turn around and say, you make me sick. Well, <laughs> it's literally true, you see. Mm -hmm. So these things have to be dealt with from a position of wisdom, mm -hmm. from a position of strength. And mm -hmm. this brings us again to the man's feet because it is his responsibility to provide the safe and secure environment, one that is filled with Islam, filled with peace, for God's mm -hmm. sake. Mm -hmm. If you're living in such torment, this is not Islam. Stop fooling yourself. Something's wrong. And it's not Islam. It's you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Is that clear? Yeah. So, we, this is... <laughs> so, uh, so, the feet to, of the... Uh, coming back to my uh, uh, first... Uh, one of my... I know I asked a lot of things and said a lot of... Things. One of the questions I asked is, what yeah. do I say to the brothers or sisters who want to stay in their marriage but don't feel in love with their husband anymore or don't feel in love with their wife anymore and uh, you know they've thought about divorce but they know that's not practical and they've kind of like maybe even accepted this is what it is this is my fate and i'm okay with it what can they do to make their marriage better well this is not a fair question okay because you you know if you're familiar with sharia uh, and I'm sure you are, you have to take each circumstance individually. Okay. And so you have, to, you have to look at the details. If you're, if you're asking an outsider to judge and you're asking them for advice, then that person who you give uh, the seat of judgment to has to examine the circumstances. And this examination requires that you help the investigation, you see. Mm -hmm. So this is what marital therapy is about. Mm -hmm. It's not always about saving the marriage. It's about investigating the marriage. Right. Say, right. What, is, what is at the root of the problem? Mm -hmm. They may not be well suited for each other. They may have fallen in love only sen sexually, sensually, mm -hmm. and they may never have had the, the two most important realms, mm -hmm. you see. And the most important realm is that of respect and nobility, that realm of chivalry, mm -hmm. 
that realm of righteousness, you see. Mm -hmm. If that's not there, then the other two cannot uh, be sustained. If all you have is this, you know, the marriage is not going to succeed. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. It, mm -hmm. No marriage succeeds on a sexual basis. It, 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 that's not sufficient, okay? It, it may... It may, you can maintain a marriage on a sexual, you can maintain a concubine, which is a lesser form of marriage on that basis. You can provide for the concubine, but she's going to go her own way, you see, because these two realms are not there for her, okay, mm -hmm. in the marriage. So she's like the college girl who's working her way to uh, university, just mm -hmm. using sexuality to get an income. You see, right. it, that's that's no place to go. So the investigator has to investigate. Okay, why uh, is there no affection? What happened to the infection, affection? Then what happened uh, to the respect for each other? Why has this respect dissipated? Or why now, can it not say be respect continued? and trust and nobility and honor ha has? Let's say the wife no longer respects her husband for X reason, uh, or the yeah. husband no longer respects. The wife for X reason. What should that couple do? What What are the what? first few steps they should? First, of course, is to admit. Okay, look. Yeah, and that's a problem. Your, that there is a problem in our marriage, and this is the problem. And the problem is, I've lost respect for you. Now what? Now what? Now what do they do? Now they have to define whether or not this is a matter of sin, or it's a matter of um, of uh, personality type. OK, mm. and intellectual uh, type, uh, because if it's a matter of sin, the man can uh, perform talba and change. Mm. Sometimes uh, an old uh, sinful nature cannot be changed. OK, or the man does not desire to be changed. So he just go through the motions and then keep on making the same mistakes. OK, so that's not going to save the marriage. But. If a man is, for example, if he's got a gambling habit or he's uh, smoking or something like this can be corrected. OK, uh, it can be corrected with uh, uh, with some how. Uh, so if the man makes an effort to correct this, then uh, the wife should uh, be able to regain some degree of respect. But if that loss of respect has to do with a loss of trust, OK, now trust is a whole different uh, uh, matter because you see the entire sexual uh, relationship, the entire gender attraction has to do with trust mm. and intimacy, intimacy has everything to do with trust. So if trust is no longer there, if the wife no longer trusts because he's just a stupid fool, and he will remain a stupid fool, he's not interested in education, he's not interested in improving himself, then she's better off divorcing, and she doesn't need his permission to divorce. This is not Islamic. Hmm. This, this idea that the wife has, the, that the husband is the only one that can divorce is not Islamic. I'm sorry, dear brother, pure chauvinism. OK, and uh, the prophet Sunnah is, 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 is proof enough of that. OK, mm. if you look carefully at some of the women around him and uh, his appeal for his appeal to uh, one woman not to divorce, he she she damn near spit in his face mm. <laughs> and said, no, you marry him. <laughs> Something to this effect. She was so disgusted with the with the man. So. You can't force a woman to stay in a marriage. You can find out whether or not there is a resolution. If there's no resolution, there's a, if there's no possible solution, then divorce is the only answer. Because, as I've said before, Allah hates divorce, but he hates strife. This uh, facility, he hates this divorce. Okay? Islam is called for peace, so part in peace, go in peace. And uh, I say to the to the man, you know, in this circumstance, if you're an uneducated fool, accept your status because that's what you are. You see, mm. <laughs> don't try to pretend otherwise. Don't try to pretend that you have a 
prosperity that you have not attained, that you have not uh, achieved, that you have not earned just because you have something hanging between your legs. That mm. does not make you a man. Mm. That does not put heaven at your feet so it can be at the feet of your spouse. Mm. Okay. That's a stupid way to think. And that way of thinking is destroying the Muslim community. It's not just a woman's fault. You got a lot of stupid fools out there pretending to be men. Okay. Mm. They're boy men. They haven't grown up. They haven't achieved boy the status. There's a lot of boy men. They're boy men. Yes, they're they're still playing games. You what what they, you go home? They're on the TV playing the game. Okay, it, it, uh, no, no, no. This is not. They're they're preoccupied with footy. Please, please, please. They're pre. You know, they, uh, um, I haven't been in a sports stadium since I left high school. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I count that as a positive towards the degree of manhood that I have managed to attain, okay? Mm. I left the games behind when I left childhood behind, okay? So think, oh, you who pretend to be men, think, mm. because your job is to provide a safe and secure environment for your wife. It's mm. not for you. It's for her. Mm. And when you do that for her, then you provide a comfortable couch can rest and enjoy after a hard day's work. And if you're not putting in a hard day's work, if you're just sitting there counting beads and pretending to be holy, this is not work. Mm. <laughs> this is not work. This provides nothing. Okay. So get it through your head, okay? Okay. To be a man, you must you must provide the nest, okay? I hope there's enough said on that. We'll probably come back to it anyway. Yeah, inshallah, uh, next time we can come back to that. One of the questions I want to ask you, inshallah, in the next uh, session we do, is about work. Uh, A lot of guys, uh, a lot of men who are providing uh, for their family. Feel or say that they're very unfulfilled with what they're doing, or that that they'd rather not do something because it doesn't make them enough money anyway, or uh, um, you know, um, why don't I just uh, wait for X opportunity and it'll give me enough money rather than do something right now? Oh, 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 oh. there is a <laughs> lot. Are... <laughs> it the, there is a lot of brothers, especially. Uh, in, in America, there's a lot of brothers, especially in certain communities, where um, the the sister or the wife is working and the husband is not, and he's okay with that. Or uh, they're on welfare, both of them. And this, especially Muslims in Europe uh, have this uh, issue where uh, crime rates of Muslims in Europe is quite high, but also the fact that they take a lot of government assistance. Mm. And then the local people there are like, you know, you come from overseas and you're not even a productive citizen. And, and that has created issues for Muslims uh, in France and in other places. Um, so so I think talking about manhood and work in, mm. in relationship to marriage uh, is also an important topic because I think some some of the brothers, or maybe I misunderstand, and then you can correct me. But I feel some of the brothers don't have a very positive or a very proper outlook towards work in in relationship. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is a all of what you've just described is out of order. It's all out of divine order, and this is a direct result of the Jewification of the world because they have introduced riba. They did uh, a fish, and uh, then these um, these men that you're talking about, who are on the dole, so to speak, they're living off of this riba. Okay, they're destined for hell because they're they're living from the reach what it is. When you take money from someone else and then you use that to provide for yourself, that's theft. That's also hellish, okay? This is 
there's no, there's nothing special about this. Now, it may be uh, something that is, uh, how shall we say, uh, a necessity, but it's only meant to be uh, temporary, you see. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of welfare, when it began, was a temporary, uh, uh, something to tide you over un until you got back on feet. So here we come back to the feet again. Right. You see, the feet of a righteous man. You see, in the in the Bible, there's a there, there's a um, uh, a saying. I think it's by Suleiman in the Proverbs. He says that the feet, the steps of a righteous man, are ordered by God. They're ordered by Allah. You mm. see. So this this has everything to do with divine order and work. You see. Uh, yeah, I've seen no, I people, can't... you know, imams taking welfare, and then they stand up and speak against uh, out against the government, and it never made sense to me. It's like <laughs> you're taking welfare from the government and you're speaking against the system, you know? The hypocrite, hypocrites, hypocrites. This is pure hypocrisy. Um, no, the, these men don't have a foot or leg to stand on, uh, metaphysically or spiritually, ethically or morally. They're morons if they, they, they speak and they live like this. Uh, they, they don't, they're not worth my time. Uh, the steps of a righteous man are so that this man works at anything that helps him to put rice or bread on the table. And each step, each day, each bowl of rice that he earns brings him closer to success or achievement, okay, mm -hmm. of a higher uh, standing, both socially and spiritually with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that those who are not working, who find all sorts of excuses to not do it, they're not making any advances at all. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, they're working up a negative balance, okay, yeah. metaphysically. And uh, this is a dangerous place to be in, and I don't blame women who don't want to have anything to do with them, because they're worthless. They're worthless. They're not even worth the, 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 the air that's going in and out of their lungs. Mm. Okay? I, I wouldn't listen to them for a moment. You know, there's no way that I would sit down in a coffee shop and, and, and have some shishka with them. It, it, it's a waste of time. OK, and that's what they do all day. Some of them. OK, they take that welfare money and then they sit and pretend to be uh, someone who's achieved something. They've achieved nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these people, they're, 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 mm, it's like the it's like the, uh, the, the uh, prophet said, they're the worst of generations. You see, the, the, what, what did he do with the man who uh, came begging, who was able-bodied? He gave him an axe. Get, go chop some wood, sell some wood. Do something. Mm. Don't just sit there with your hand out. I don't blame the beggar, okay? The beggar who has no alternative, okay, he has a right. He has a right at least to eat something, okay? Mm. But the man who's able-bodied and who just sits there making excuses, saying, oh, that's not worth my time, he's a proud, arrogant fool. Mm. It's a proud, arrogant fool. Mm. And he's probably ignorant as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I hope I'm making a whole and bunch of And then when his wife comes home with a paycheck, uh, and, you know, he tells her what to do with her paycheck. Oh, uh, no. and, and, and then everything is upside down, you know. This is... This is no way to live. This, this is not is right. Happening this here is in the United States. Nothing Islamic and... about this. Yeah. Nothing Islamic about it. It's not even worth discussing except to just reject it for what it is. All right. It's hell. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, it, it's probably not a good note to end on, but uh, you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> So, and inshallah ta'ala, uh, until next time. I, I'm, an old, I'm an old man, and I'm very opinionated, okay? <laughs> and uh, I have worked, I, I'll tell you this, so, so all my brothers can hear now, okay? I have worked since I was eight years old, wow. and I'm retired, and I'm still working at 70, okay? Mm. I have never not 
worked. I worked at any job that would provide me an income mm. until I could prove my status. Mm. Okay. And that's my advice to each and every one of you. Subhanallah. Inshallah. God okay. will. Dr. Omar, till next time. Uh, yes. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, thank you for the uh, conversation, for the interview. Uh, so take care. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Shadow and